Let's see in your next shift. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm a chemist, not a medical doctor, so a lot of what I'm talking is on chemistry. Okay, a lot of medical terms I don't know how to pronounce. So, uh, pardon me for that. Okay, so, um, first of all, let me introduce what my organization, what my lab does. Um, the Energy Transitology Lab is the only laboratory in Singapore that provides a wide range of toxicology analysis for biological fluids. And usually, these are for clinical and medical purpose, and because we are the only lab in Singapore, we see what is uh, being submitted in all of the hospitals in Singapore. Uh, we have two units in this laboratory. One is the Drugs and Abuse Testing Unit, which carries out analysis for controlled drugs. Their main focus is to analyze controlled drugs in the urine, and recently also in hair, and for the administration of uh, the Misuse of Drugs Act. So their main client will be the Central Narcotic Bureau. Um, the Clinical and Forensic Toxicology Unit performs clinical and forensic toxicology analysis for the management of suspected drug intoxication and investigations of links to drug-related crimes or death. So uh, all post-mortem cases, if specimens are taken for toxicology, will be sent to this particular lab. So our clients um, will be the law enforcement agencies for the forensic cases. Uh, Army, Singapore Armed Forces, usually they screen for their army boys for routine uh, random urine screenings, okay, because these guys hold guns, so you have to screen them. Um, hospitals, of course, for the uh, suspected poisonings, private laboratories and clinics, mortuaries, forensic pathologies, even publics which they suspect their mates are poisoning dead or they are being poisoned by neighbors or unfriendly colleagues. And also SPCA, which is cruelty to animals, uh, because there are cases of uh, poisoning of animals, and uh, it, it is under penal code that you, you, you should not harm animals. <laughs> so we do have cases of uh, intentional poisoning a lot about that, so, so for animals and cats. Uh, in the clinical and forensic talks, we handle about 9,000 cases, meaning 9,000 patients of disease. Um, sample load is about 15,000. We have eight scientists and 12 laboratory officers who handles all the experiments. The drugs abuse testing unit handles about 35,000 living samples, and we have uh, more manpower in that sense. Okay, so the test that we do, I think, is very straightforward. We do drugs abuse testing. In urine and hair, recently only since last May, because uh, it is only recently introduced into the Museum of Drug Act that we can analyze drugs in hair. And drugs in hair tends to stay longer. Okay, you, we can detect uh, for 3 cm, usually we are talking about 3 months history. Okay. So, uh, so that means we can uh, see whether there are cases of. Uh, usually these are used for super VCs, which they are already out of their rehab, they are now working. But they do have to go back to CMD to do their routine checking. But because these are probably the good behavior ones, that really allows them to do the hair so that they don't have to come back every week. Okay. Uh, we also do drug uh, workplace drug testings for um, usually um, shit person. Uh, Singapore is not mandatory, but in US, uh, those dealing with transportation, mass transportations, they are mandatory have to undergo pre-employment or workplace drug testing. Uh, forensic exhibits that are found beside the deceased or that are found beside the patient will be submitted for an examination, post-mortem toxicology for the deceased, anti-mortem toxicology including drug facilitated crime, drug facilitated, uh, drug and rot, drug and rape. Okay, so these are forensic cases and also driving under the influence of alcohol and drugs. Blood alcohol and tolerance determinations, emergency toxicology for brain death certification that we do on a 24 7 uh, because of the uh, potential organ transplant cases. We need to do the drug levels, make sure that it is all below the therapy levels before the doctors can use that to certify brain death. And also occasionally of occupational biological monitoring. Okay, what is the uh, definition? I think. Uh, Dr. Chan actually introduced what is speculation drugs. It's a drug or substance used non-medically for personal enjoyment. And it actually includes the coffee that we just take, 
the alcohol, the impurity tonight, and occasional nicotine. Of course, now we focus on the controlled substances. We start with uh, tolerant abuse in Singapore. Okay, tolerant abuse. Uh, the Intoxicating Substances Act is enacted sometime in the 80s when tolerant abuse or glue sniffing started. And uh, tolerant is the active ingredient that you can find in paint thinner or super glue like this contact glue, which costs less um, about the cost of uh, ice cream. Okay, so um, usually these are used by teenagers. Um, the symptoms, example, this is uh, extracted from the case notes. These are, we don't see the patient, so we're not too sure what they present. So we rely on the doctor's description to tell us what kind of uh, symptoms is related to this drug. So example, this doctor says, is the patient developed giddiness, palpitation while sniffing blue, and then lost conscious. So he was brought in by the police to the A&E, where he regained his consciousness again. So, tolerant is currently listed under the Intoxicating Substance Act. Actually, there's only one compound in the Intoxicating Substance Act, which is tolerant. So, it is a prosecutable fact. According to the CME, the Central Narcotic Bureau Statistics, um, most of the profile of inhaled abusers are usually teenagers. We have seen as young as 9 years old. Okay, so they are usually teenagers in the 11 to 15 years old secondary schoolers, and of course, uh, usually the older generation ones, uh, they use the hard drugs. And we can see that across the years from 2007, which this is uh, again downloaded from CME website, they started their statistic in 2007, there's a gradual decrease in tolerant abuse. Uh, each year, the new abusers outnumber the uh, repeat ab abusers, because uh, I think this is something that they think they can try. It's easy, easily available, and they don't think there's any danger related to blue sniffing. So there are more new users. But in recent years, you can see that the new users actually dropped tremendously. So did CMB do a good job educating the schoolers? Or did they switch to something else? Okay. <laughs> so, um, this is uh, again from all the uh, UNODC's uh, websites and uh, experience across other countries. Uh, these are volatiles that can be abused, hydrocarbons, uh, butane, which is, uh, yes, there's a uh, lighter fluid, okay. uh, gasoline, so so correction fluid is your liquid paper last time. Nowadays, now it's the correction tape, no more liquid paper. And also, um, Topical energy sticks such as the prions and ethyl chloride, uh, and also uh, inhalational anesthetics such as nitrous oxide or the laughing gas and isofurane. And the last one is amyl butyl nitrate, which is actually just now it was mentioned is for cyanide antidote. Right? It is also known as poppers and is used by uh, homosexuals because it uh, enhances sex. Okay, so it is um, the gold rush at the bottom. Those are poppers. Our illicit drugs lab, which deals with cease drugs, encountered this a couple of years ago, but don't see them much nowadays. So, one example. This is the dark chloride abuse in 2012. You still note that 2011 onwards, the total abuse has dropped, right? So in 2012, we have this particular case, 24-year-old female, um, China, um, female yes, that's right. um, she was brought in by police to the hospital on two different occasions, shock days that mean that she was uh, suspected of inhaled abuse, brought in, she was released because of the third evidence, and then she come back again, 12 days later. In both cases, her uh, blood was uh, found to contain without chloride. And we use chromatographic analysis to do it, and based on the retention time, this is beta chloride. Another case in August, slightly earlier, is an 18 year old female student. She was found dead, lying face down on her bed. Her mother checked her on the morning, she was there, okay. She checked her in the evening, and she was found in this situation. Her right hand was clutching a beta chloride, blue white spray can. Okay, not necessarily this one because the police did not submit, but this is what we can get from the internet. 
and her left hand was clutching an orange plastic bag. Okay, so it appears that she's huffing or snuffing the gas. And ether chloride, uh, for the postmodern samples, ether chloride was detected in all her specimens. Okay, so ether chloride is actually colorless, very volatile. Uh, it has a boiling point of 12, de uh, 12 degrees, meaning that at room temperature is a gas. Uh, it actually has an unpleasant odor. Okay. Uh, it's used as a topical anesthetic and anesthetic to temporarily relieve minor spots injuries. It cools the skin by numbing it, I guess, so that you don't feel the pain. It is, has a sedating effect and was used previously as an anesthetic, but it, the use was actually discontinued due to high incidence of this weakness. And the reported symptoms uh, in literature, uh, this has been uh, reported elsewhere in, in other countries or so. So the, the ones I have is only that particular two case after all these years. So this is the reported symptoms. Um, they present with drowsiness, shakiness, inability to walk with, uh, because of impaired balance, blur vision or double vision, confusion, disoriented, muscle incorporeal coordination, of course, I guess you must have some euphoria effect, otherwise they won't be sleeping. Um, and it's hallucination effect. What other volatiles uh, are people doing? Butane, this is a case last year, is very young, 15 year old male. Um, the case history is according to the friends that was with him that time. Um, he was chatting with friends near a staircase. Someone suggested to inhale from a small cylinder of lighter gas to achieve a laughing gas effect. Uh, so they release the lighter gas into a plastic bag and start huffing. And the subject inhaled twice through his mouth and suddenly he dropped the plastic bag and started running off. Okay, later he was found dead at the staircase landing. Okay, he has a past history of asthma. The cause of the death given by the pathologist is consistent with cardiac arrhythmia due to hydrocarbon inhalation. The bottle of uh, butane gas was also sent in for analysis. Uh, well, it contains butane as, as labelled. The effects of butane, according to the literature, is that the cause of course, euphoria, excitation. Okay. Um, very generic, uh, I would think that it's very generic symptoms. Blur vision, slur, uh, slur speech, nausea, or vomiting. And as you increase the dose, you might have confusion, distortion, hallucination. And hallucination can be either aesthetic or terrifying. So whether the boy actually suddenly becomes very terrified and starts running off, we don't know. Okay? And uh, aggressive and risk taking. So sometimes, uh, but this volatile abuses, if they become um, intoxicated, sometimes they think they can fly and they jump off the building. That's what happened with tolerant abuse in the early 80s and 90s. A lot of youngsters actually jump off the building because of this hallucinating effect. So uh, large doses of uh, tachycardia, seen as present, so this could be one that's uh, leading to his death. And also in 2012, actually, new paper and uh, Asia, on, Asia One Online uh, News actually reported and interviewed a few youngsters and they say that um, they, they do do a bit of ethyl chloride, okay? So it, it is out there. People are admitting that they are doing... Um, psychiatrists are saying that they are also seeing patients doing it, okay? Although some of the um, write-up in the newspaper says that um, they use this because they want the laughing effect. But when I search, actually, ethyl chloride or butane does not give that kind of laughing effect, okay? So I'm not too sure what they are taking. They thought that they are taking ethyl chloride. So the challenges in uh, analysing these volatiles, um, although you see that there's a drastic drop in the tolerance, we are not seeing increasing number of ethyl chloride or butane abuse, although they are really death, meaning that there are people doing it, it's just that these are the unlucky ones. Okay, so why are we not seeing it that much? It's because um, the gas itself is volatile, okay? The sample collection and storage is very important. Because they are gas at room temperature, so to, when the doctors collect the blood for such investigation, we hope that they can fill up the blood tube so that you reduce the heat space. Heat space is the space above the liquid. If you have more of this heat space, volatiles will tend to accumulate 
in the space above, and once we open up, it's gone. Okay, so if you can fill up the tube as close to, to the beam, that will reduce the head space, and of course the best is to keep it in the fridge if you have if you cannot send it off today. Or during the transportation, if your couriers have go over Singapore to send all the samples, it's best to keep it in the ice box. That will increase our chance of detecting it. Analyze is actually analysis is actually quite straightforward. We use the same um, analysis method for our alcohols and tolerance. So it is not too difficult to analyze, it's the sample itself. Okay, next we go into the NPS, the new psychoactive drugs. This case happened in 2011. Um, these two cases, we have two different submissions on two different dates, but actually looking at the history itself, it looks like they, they are in the same incident. Okay, it's just that uh, the, the sample was sent the later. So it's the, the involved two male, one Chinese, one Caucasian, they are found unconscious in the hotel room or floor. And the doctor on the description says that they found two medications, phenazepam and this long chain of things, okay? Uh, he managed to write down this is because uh, the, the patient actually have a packet beside him that has this label. So the doctor was quite nice enough to tell us what he saw. That long chain of name actually is now commonly known as methoxamine. It's a sedative, dissociative hallucinogen, hallucinogen actually. It actually is an analog or chemically related to ketamine. Okay, that's why the methoxetamine. Okay, so it's actually related to ketamine. The difference is this branch here, they substitute with them some of the branch, they add one more carbon here, and it becomes a new compound. The, this is a new drug, so the, uh, the metabolism, the excretion, the toxicity is not known. So how do you get the data? People are trying this. Okay, so they are let animals trying this. <laughs> so just to tell you how we actually approach a, to a typical toxicology testing, most of our compounds are actually screened by chromatographic methods, not chemical analysis, okay? And uh, such as liquid chromatography and gas chromatography, what you can remember from your high school, university days. Eh? And uh, identification is mainly based on the retention time, and then we need to confirm it by uh, looking at the chemical characteristic of the compound itself, whether it can be by accurate mass, uh, mass spectrum or UV visible spectrum. And those highlighted in blue means that in order to establish this kind of identification method, you need reference standard. Okay? This is a typical chromatogram of a, a GC chromatogram of some basic drugs, such as diazepam, small diazepam, midazolam, and uh, triazolam, saprozolams. Okay, so this is based on retention time that we want uh, every day in the laboratory. It's a 30 minutes run. But this particular method, we can actually identify two to three hundred drugs. Meaning that, based on retention time itself, it may not be unique enough because two to three hundred drugs, imagine squeezing here, some drugs will have the same retention time. So this is only a screening to let us know what it could be there. Then we have to use other uh, spectrometric methods to confirm it. So this is called the time of flight MS, okay, mass spec of methoxamine, we use, because methoxamine at that time is not known to us, it's new, pretty new, we can only know the chemical structure online. So we use this uh, technique, we run into the instrument, and because we know the molecular weight of this compound, so we extract the ion for this molecular weight, and then do an accurate mass match. So we measure this is the mass of the compound found here. And the expected mass is this, so it's actually very accurate. So it is likely that it is, it is, uh, it could be this compound. But bear in mind that there are millions of chemicals in the world. Pedidine actually has the same formula also. So you can't exclude pedidine from just just by looking at this peak. You think that it is uh, methoxetamine. So we have another technique, GCMS, and we have this spectrum here. At that time, there's no commercial library that stores this as a database. And we don't have reference standards to compare. So what happened in this particular case is I sent a spectrum to my overseas counterpart in Germany, which they see much earlier than us, and asked whether is this a spectrum for this compound. They confirmed. So then we can report this in the uh, report. We, note that just now there's two drugs that is found beside him. The other drug is actually phenazepam. 
Phenazepam is a tranquilizer that is used clinically since the 80s as a sedative and hypnotic drugs, but principally only in Russia and the other Commonwealth of independent states, not in other countries. Okay? The structure is actually quite similar to bromazepam, except for this ring here. Okay, so this is actually a legitimate drug, but in Russia. This is a gas spectrum. So you understand when we say gas spectrums are quite unique, this looks very different from just now the compound. And um, since 2011, after the two cases, we, we saw another case in 2012, and 2013 is starting to boom up. And this tallies with what we see in the CIS drugs uh, that is uh, carried out by the EC drugs lab in HSA. They also see an increase. So where does this compound come from? We believe that there might be um, manufacturers actually making phenazepam, but in the form of aramine 5, because aramine 5, nimidazepam, is actually quite commonly abused in Singapore. Okay? So to the addicts, they can't tell the difference. Okay? So they don't know what they are taking in. So we also analyzed, this is actually what we analyzed in the lab. We thought it looks like aramine 5, but it actually contains phenazepam. And this is actually observed also in other countries like uh, Malaysia, Thailand, and Taiwan. That they say that the CIS, aramine 5, all does not contain new diazepam, but finazepam. And what is the difference between these two? Of course, finazepam is not controlled. New diazepam is controlled. It's a class C controlled drug in Singapore. Um, finazepam is not prescribed drug in Singapore. You probably can get it from the internet. Nimidazepam is, you can get a prescription from it, okay? We have addicts that actually uh, get prescription from it, so whenever they are arrested, they say, I got prescription, okay? <laughs> but their sources may not be the one that they have. Okay, what is most important is the half-life for this particular drug is a long-acting, is 60 hours. And Nimidazepam, because it's a Japanese drug, there's not many literature on this, probably all in Japanese, I can't read. So what uh, some of the... Um, Literatures claim that it is about 8 to 26 hours. It's intermediate acting drugs. So imagine that the, the, the what, abuser thought they are taking nimidazepam, but end up they are taking finazepam. What will be the effect? <laughs> we'll tell you the effect later. Uh, out of the 57, 58, uh, 57 cases that we saw in 2013, uh, 57 years. 11 of them are related in post-mortem cases and uh, anti-mortem cases including uh, of which half of it is actually related to driving under the influence. These guys are taking drugs and they are still driving on the road. So these are the symptoms, uh, these are the driving under the influence case histories. Um, patients brought in by police exhibiting all those um, symptoms, inability to stand. He's not even to stand, but he's driving. <laughs> okay, so his, his blood results are at the side. The other case, he was swerving while driving, seems confused. When the, um, I think he had an accident, that's why the uh, SCDF, the civil defense is actually at this spot already. This sort of patient. He has, he has finazepam, minidazepam also, because some of these uh, aramine 5 tablets not just have finazepam, they have a mixture. So it depends on their production quality. Sometimes they have imita, sometimes they have fina, sometimes they have both. Okay. And also, uh, ketamine was found in his body. The other one, he was arrested by police for hitting a few cars. Although he's still alert, but he has, uh, he's probably alert because of MDNA. Uh, that keep him alert. <laughs> so, the other case is coming after falling asleep while on motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And then he collides with another hockey. So again, you look at the common profiles. These guys is always together, so they probably don't know what they're taking. And because um, I think they are so used to taking nimidazepam, they probably think that they know the effect. So maybe after one day or a few hours, I can start driving. But they didn't know that if they're taking, taking finazepam, the half-life is 60 hours. It's a long-acting drug, so they still go out driving. And out of the 11, uh, the 11 postmodern cases, some of them, yes, this is also under influence. Lost control of vehicle, collided head on with the van, fell from height, sudden death, found drowned in swimming pool. And the last one is quite dramatic, it's on the news last 
then last year, uh, this guy actually, um, he was in a taxi, he demanded to drive, oh no, he was in his friend's car, and he demanded the driver to stop because he wanted to pee. And then he ran out of the car, when the car is on an expressway. Okay. He ran out of the car, <coughs> run between the four lanes, there's four lanes, he was running back and forth a few times, and um, he was hit by a traffic police <laughs> on duty. And then, because he can't avoid him, but when he was hit, the first time he did die, he bounced to the next lane, which then asked traffic police, <laughs> and he was killed then. Okay. And this is, uh, if you follow the news, this is Dui and Ong, a complaint. Dui and Ong is the one that actually shot someone with a gun in the nightclub. Okay, so this is a complaint of that guy. Okay, so um, he has actually, he has besides Pinazipam, zero point. Uh, one microgram per minimum. He also had 200 milligram percent of alcohol, which is three times above the legal limit. Okay, so it is a mixed effect. Uh, benzodiazepines and alcohols have synergic effect. They enhance each other. Okay. And the amount of phenazepam uh, uh, that is detected here is actually within the levels that is reported overseas for those people arrested driving under the influence of. Okay, so it's consistent. Okay, another drug called Foxy. Okay, they have all very nice names. Uh, this is also a postmodern case. Uh, the, the patient, I forgot to tell, uh, I think it's a young man also, found lying naked and motionless on bed. That's at home. Two condoms are found on the floor next to the disease. The disease has known, is known to have a weak heart. And the toxicology finding, well, he has his uh, heart medications. But he also take methamphetamines, and he also had Viagra, mm -hmm. and alcohol plus Foxy. So he's uh, like the Dr. Jin says, young young kids like to explore around. I think adults also. <laughs> so they really mix their drugs. Foxy is another name for 5 methoxy isopropanotreptamine and it is abused for its hallucinogenic effect, and of course the mouth euphoric effect. Uh, other tractamines include psilocin. Psilocin is an active ingredient found in magic mushroom. Okay, so they are the same family. And the reported effects include hypertension, hypotension, underway, tachycardia. This guy has a weak heart, remember. Okay, so he's trying with that. Okay, another drug called Matalon. Uh, we have three cases just this year, early this year, I mean, uh, a gap of one month. First case is uh, 35-year-old male Chinese admitted to eight uh, emergency department, initially a bit feverish, people that pupil dilated, confused tachycardia. So actually the doctor suspect his overdose on cough syrup. For me from the, um, the interviews, he has taken cough syrup. So the urine was sent for tox. Well, he did have a lot of uh, cough syrup, codeine, epidrine, prominazine, dextro, dextromethophen, phenethyloxamine, paracetamol. He has a bit of benzo nitrosifum and this guy, which is huge in the urine. Okay, we saw a huge concentration of this. The second case, one month later, a 19-year-old male Chinese arrested for acute delirium had to be pharmacologically restrained with IV for IV had a paragon. He was given IV insulin, dextrose. 50%, but his hypercount just keep drifting downwards. Okay, so actually the doctor initially suspect it's a glucampermite overdose. Why glucampermite? He specifically write glucampermite overdose is because of the previous years there's a power war one, uh, power one walnut cases, where every time the patient was presented with a hypoglycemia, they will start to suspect glucampermite. Okay. So um, the blood and urine was sent. Again, we saw methanol, methoxetamine, methamphetamines, and a compound that we can't really truly pinpoint is the um, DMMSC, which I'll talk later. The third case, almost very young also, 80-year-old male Chinese found in the hotel room. Okay, So you, you can see something. A lot of them are found in hotel room. They're having parties in hotel room. <laughs> Confused, violent, aggressive, metabolic acidosis, altered mental state. In ED, he has uh, he's presented with tachycardia, required sedation. So the doctor suspects uh, amphetamines, okay, because it does relate to that symptoms. So the blood and urine toxicology again found methylol, methoxetamine, MDMA, ecstasy, methamphetamines, sildenafil, 
Usually those that's found in hotel tend to have fine gradient. And also this compound which we cannot confirm. What? Metalone has this structure, it is actually closely related to MDMA. Okay, the difference is you have a ketone group here. Okay? And the two compounds, 4-MEC and D-MMSC, actually has the same formula. It has the same formula. It's just that this long branch now shift to this place. Okay? And this is very common in the new cycle of active drug. They just move the branches, add a bit here, add a bit there, and it's a new compound altogether. And they play around with the law enforcement agency. If you control this, I change the structure. I will bet this. So that's what our Japan counterpart is telling me. This is controlled in Japan. The next week, this compound will appear in Korea because Korea has not been controlled yet. And then this new compound will come, come out. So the scientists and the labs are always playing a uh, catching up game. And the effect of metalone is actually, again, euphoria hallucination, an increase in sociability, same as MDMA, okay? But it is also caused uh, insomnia, restlessness, tachycardia, hypertension, hypertension, hypothermia, and stretching. This is actually quite similar to MDMA. And it has been reported to cause death, uh, where this journal reported three deaths. The symptoms uh, include seizure-like activities, elevated body temperatures, and metabolic acidosis. Remember, one of the patients also exhibited a metabolic acidosis. So MPS that is already encountered and um, encountered by our laboratory in the illicit drugs lab are all these things, okay? If you are not too familiar, these are synthetic cannabinoids. It's all called JWH. Okay, JWH is actually the initial of the chemist who actually starts to synthesize one whole big chunk of this. Okay, so it's named after him. Okay. So these are the new ones, the AMs. Okay. So again, you just have to same compound RCS4. You just have to add in two methoxy isomer. Just add in a row. So you are one for four, add in a five for a four compound at a, a four atom at a five position, you get a new compound. So this needs to go on and on. So this is already detected in the C structs that is submitted by CMP. Okay. And the synthetic catenoids, one more chance, the red ones are what we saw in the um, toxicology. Okay. And others, the red ones are the ones we already reported. Okay, so others and phenyl, thalamines, all this ABC, 2CD, and the new bonds. Okay, uh, Dr. Chan mentioned just now. It's like a broader paper about one cm with one, two, uh, this is this is what, one cm, right? It's a very small thing. Used, it's almost like last time when they uh, abused LSD. LSD is also appear as this as stems. Okay, you just lick behind because it's sprayed behind the stems. You just lick. So the newborns are also this, uh, abused this way, meaning that they are actually in minor amount, minute amount, yet very toxic. They haven't been reported word death on this already. Okay, so what is the problem with MPS? This uh, slide was given by the illicit drugs lab. Do you know what you're taking or not? Out of the 73 capsules uh, that is submitted, it's not quite homogeneous color, okay, so you know that it's illicitly produced. The, the lab analyzed 28 capsules. And out of the 28 capsules, 20 capsules contains methylcothamine and methoxamine. And then two capsules only contains one compound. And six capsules has nothing. So do you know what you're talking? You'll be lucky if you're taking this one, actually. Although it's not worth your money. And also, in tablets form, they come in all kinds of tablets. And when you analyze them, uh, they are usually uh, cut with uh, caffeine to give you the excitement. Uh, the main compound here is methylone, but it also contains ketamines, MDPD, methyl. It's actually dextromethorphan, a bit of synthetic cannabinoids, and what is here is the tetraazines. Okay, and this varies from tablet to tablet, so you really don't know what you're taking. So the challenges. Uh, we are, as a lab, we are playing a catching up games in the area of drugs abuse. It's mentioned over and over again because the internet plays a very important role. Everything can be purchased on the internet. Information can be purchased on the internet. There's drug forums where you can first ask, how, how is the drug like, before you test it. Okay? Of, of course, what you buy again is not what you think it is. And reference standards which is necessary for analysis is not always available and can be very expensive. Last year we spent 100k just buying standards. 
and the pharmacologic, uh, pharmacokinetics of these drugs and substances are not fully understand, understood. Metabolisms are not understood also. So sometimes when it is taken into the body, it gets metabolized like the synthetic cannabinoid. It gets fully metabolized to the hydroxy metabolite. And if you do not have the hydroxy metabolite, you cannot confirm the presence. So, and metabolites are even more expensive and also not that. Um, so amount, the trace amount like synthetic cannabinoids are very, very low, so we need very sensitive instruments to do it. We need to constantly develop methods to, to actually test for it. And uh, because we have a, a doctor from AE here, I would like to appeal that if you look at those uh, cases for the driving under the influence of drugs, you can see that there are actually multiple drugs involved. And we need to repeat the samples to confirm the results. So sometimes we sure appreciate a full blood tube instead of just two meals to do that many drugs. Okay. Thank you. I would like to uh, acknowledge my colleagues from Illicit Drug Slab, which provides all of the uh, statistics and the pictures, and also the organizing committee of SEMS, who invite me to share this with you. Thank you.